So Dr. Susie Curry is the Dean of Faculty of Pure and Applied Science and Professor of Biology at Acadia. Her career was inspired by many Acadia faculty and staff, beginning with her honors biology degree in 1991. Susie left Acadia to study for her master's in science and then her PhD at Queen's University and was supervised by Acadia alumnus, Dr. Bruce Tufts of the class of 1982. Shortly after completing her PhD, Susie went on to the Charles and Catherine Darwin Postdoctoral Fellowship at the University of Cambridge, UK, where once again, she worked with an Acadia alumnus, Dr. Bob Bootlier, class of 76 and 96. Her Acadia roots re run deep, as she would say, and Acadia alumni truly are everywhere. In addition to being Dean of Faculty of Science, Susie is an active researcher and marine and freshwater biologist funded by the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council. Together with her students, she studies how fishes respond to climate warming and environmental stress. So as I said, Susie has prepared a presentation that I will share from my screen. So Susie, please feel free to ask me to move from uh, uh, um, file to file, back and forth, whatever you'd like, and I'll do my best to keep up with you. Um, and as I mentioned as well, Susie will pause midway through uh, for any questions that show up in the chat function or for those who would like to ask them verbally. Uh, and then we'll do question and answer again at the end. So I think that's it for from me and uh, over to you, Susie. Thanks, Una, and thanks so much for inviting me to do this. And apologies for the technical difficulties. Uh, I don't think that I'm going to be able to see your screen. So um, I may have to check in to find out what slide we're on in a couple okay. of times. Uh, and hopefully that will work out okay. We, we will figure this out. We'll figure this out. So I'm going to pretend that I'm advancing the slides and see how that goes. So first slide, um, fish that live in trees. Well, we're going to get there. Thanks again. So next slide, please, Una. So as many of you, I'm sure, COVID-19 has preoccupied me um, these days. And as I was thinking about this presentation, I realized that, believe it or not, a topic of fish that live in trees, for me, actually has a COVID-19 connection. So kind of a subtext to what I want to talk to you about today is how social isolation, even in fishes and fishes that live in trees, can impact coping with stress. And I want to iterate that I work on fish, fish are vertebrates, but a lot of the fish functioning or physiology is very common. It's common throughout the vertebrate world. So we can actually glean a lot about stress, about hormone levels, and even about sociality. Um, by looking at fish, we can make some inferences to higher vertebrates like ourselves. Next slide, please, Una. So fish, when we think about fish, we think about fish in the water. And certainly most species of fish, over 99% of the fish species actually do live in water. But there are very few uh, that can live in water but also live on land and arguably in trees. And I've always been drawn, I think, to the exceptions to the rule, uh, which has led me to a lot of this research. So we think of fish and water like these beautiful tropical fish. And like I said, indeed, you know, there's over 10,000 species of fish. They're the most species of all vertebrates in that there's the most number of species. And there are only about 300 or so species that can also breathe air. Next slide, please, Una. Are you on the Devonian? Am I? I'm on the slide that has several very colorful fish. Okay, the fish that live in water. Next slide, please. There we go. Now I'm on the Devonian. Great. So to understand how fish could possibly live in trees or breathe air, we have to go back in time about 400 million years to the Devonian. And here is it's a really important period of time in our evolution. This is really where fish took that first monumental step onto land, which led to our eventual evolution, this transition from water to land. And this happened likely because the climate in the Devonian was pretty harsh. 
lots of storms, very variable, high temperatures, low oxygen levels. Next slide, please, Una. So arguably at that time, next slide, please. You can just click, you should see very low oxygen. Mm -hmm. That was a big challenge um, during the Devonian where oxygen levels were likely very low. So some fishes may have been well adapted to deal with those low oxygen levels, whereas others may have found it more challenging. So all they really had to do was stick their head out of the water, I'm simplifying of course, and there's this vast supply of oxygen available to them in air because air has a lot more oxygen in it than water. So over evolutionary time, this is what happened. Um, the fish fins were modified, the neck girdle was modified so they could actually hoist themselves up out of water. So this was really that kind of first step in that vertebrate transition from water to land. Next slide, please, Una. So if we think about this kind of in a trajectory, we have most of the fish species that we know today are aquatic. And we have, again, these few species that are air breathing, that spend time um, many, sometimes many months to years um, out of water. And then we now have exiting. amphibious fishes that can actually exploit both land and water. And that's what I'm gonna focus on this afternoon. Next slide, please, Una, for the text above. So modern amphibious fishes, like the one I'm gonna tell you about this afternoon, can offer insight into biological adaptations that may have been important in that monumental transition from water to land. Next slide, please. And this is just a fun picture of some of these examples of these exceptions of these amphibious or air breathing fishes. So the big one gulping air is an arapaima. They can get to be seven feet long. You'll see in the upper right-hand corner, one of my favorite fish, the mud skippers, an amphibious fish. We see um, an African lungfish down at the bottom and you can look at its modified fins that actually allow it to crawl along um, the surface. So they can kind of walk in water and walk on land. Next slide, please, Una. But the star of the show today for me is this little guy. This is the mangrove rivulus. And this is the fish that we're studying here at Acadia and that I've also studied um, in the field. It's a small fish. It's only a few centimeters. Doesn't look like much, but it's probably one of the most interesting fish I know. Next slide, please. So where do we find mangrove rivulus? We find it, um, it's a tropical fish, so we find it in Florida, in the mangroves in Florida, in the Caribbean, in Central America, and in the northern part of South America, as you see in that slide. And as their name would imply, they live in mangroves. And mangroves are these wonderful ecosystems. They are really a magical place, uh, and they're very important. They sequester three to five times as much carbon dioxide as rainforests. They can prevent flooding, prevent against erosion. They are rich in biodiversity for birds, fishes, other wildlife. They serve as a nursery ground for many species of fish. Um, but unfortunately, they're rapidly declining and often this is our fault. Uh, there's a lot of mangrove destruction and again, often to make way for sandy resorts, unfortunately. Next slide, please, Una. So when you think of mangroves, at least when I started working on this fish, when I thought of mangroves, I thought of a picture like this. It's kind of exotic and, you know, maybe some of you have actually kayaked or canoed through these mangroves. You know, they're very beautiful, very serene. And this is really what most people think of when you think of a mangrove. However, it's not always like this. Um, and to study the fish that we do, we have to go into the mangrove and we have to go into the mud because the fish we work on is actually in the shallows, in and around the mud, where it gets pretty extreme. Next slide, please. So here you see the inner, the innards of the mangrove. And this is actually a slide from a field site of ours in Belize, where we've done um, a few years of work. So in the mangroves, there's a lot of mud. It's really hot and steamy. There are a lot of bugs, um, a lot of mosquitoes. 
Um, there's some tarantulas kicking around. You might find boa constrictors. It's really, the water here is really low in oxygen, if not anoxic, meaning no oxygen. The water is hot and it's high dissolved organic carbon, which is why it has that tea-like um, look to it. And it is also very rich in hydrogen sulfide. So it has a rotten egg smell. So not really the glamorous place I thought it was gonna be the first time I went there um, to do field work. <laughs> And you'll also see the next slide, please, um, Una. We sometimes get visitors um, in and amongst the mud. And this is a small um, saltwater, saltwater crocodile that we have to be careful of when we're tromping around the muck. Next slide, please, Una. And this is a picture from one of my students, um, Carrie Martin, who's actually standing in the mangrove, um, taking a sample of, I think that's a pH sample, where we monitor the pH the oxygen levels, the temperature, ammonia, hydrogen sulfide. She's still smiling though, hanging on for dear life. You see she's holding on to one of these mangrove roots, which will be important in a moment. Next slide, please, Una. So fish that live in trees, where am I going with this? Well, I've told you about these, these mangrove rivulets. They are amphibious fishes, so they can spend time in water and spend time in land. So where do they live in the mangrove? Well, you can see in the picture on the right where you see these kind of um, fingers which represent the mangrove roots and they're embedded in the mud. So these fish live in crab burrows. They're really neat structures. You can see one on the top left that are at the base of these mangrove roots. They're quite deep. Sometimes they're terminal like the picture you see here and sometimes there's an interconnected web of these burrows. And they live seemingly quite harmoniously with these humongous um, nocturnal crabs, land crabs that you see here on the left. So we can trap these fish just with plastic cups. And sometimes we might find one fish in a crab burrow, maybe two fish, but usually small group, no more than small groups, which will be important in a moment. Next slide, please, Una. So what's one of the many cool things about this fish is that they can live without water. So here, this is a picture taken by my student, Carrie. So mangroves are tidal. So you'll have wet seasons and you'll have dry seasons. And in the wet seasons, no problem, right? The crab burrows are full with water. You'll even get small pools and the fish are probably mostly in water. They will emerge or jump out and be in air for sometimes because the water conditions are poor, but sometimes for no apparent reason at all, or at least not one that we understand. And stick to the side of the tree so the fish are actually in the trees in air without any water. In the dry season, when a lot of the water will leave the mangrove, what these fish do is they kind of burrow in damp or decaying logs like you see here with no water. It's damp, but there's no water. And next slide, please, Una. They can kind of burrow, you see in these little, um, narrows that are in these the mangrove logs that are just sort of lying that you know on a bottom of the the forest to the forest floor in the mud again no water but a humid um damp environment so it's pretty cool and they can stay there for quite a long time which we can get to in a minute next slide please una these are a couple of other um, nice uh picks from one of my collaborators scott taylor where you can see the fish out of water um and burrowing in these trees. So when they're in water, fish breathe oxygen using their gills. And when they're in land, like you see in these, these logs, they use their skin to take up oxygen, much like you see, you know, well, frogs will do. Next slide, please, Una. So the other very cool thing, another very cool thing about these fish is that we think they have what we're coining environmentally dependent sociality. So like I told you, when there's water in the wet season and they're living in these crab burrows, you don't really find very many fish together. So they're not a fish that form these large schools or large shoals. There might be one fish, two fish, three fish, there's Dr. Seuss in here, um, but they, they can be isolated. Now when the water goes and they burrow in these damp and decaying logs, they do something we call log packing, and you can find fish, the tens to the hundreds, all jam packed into these logs. So the environment appears to dictate their social behavior. 
And this is what I've been interested in for quite some time. Social behavior, which we'll come to in a moment, as well as climate warming and the interaction between an animal's sociality or sociability and climate change. But I thought this might be a good point to pause if anyone had any questions. I'd be happy to take them before we move on with the last couple minutes, or I can keep going. So I'm just checking the chat on the side. I'm not seeing any questions there. Oh, we do have one from Liz Ketty. She says, is there a similar type of this fish in the other mangroves around the world? Great question. Um, yeah, so interestingly, air breathing fishes um, tend to be found, or amphibious fishes, in tropical areas. There are some exceptions to that, but most of the world's amphibious or air-breathing fishes are found in tropical climates and in mangroves. So there are sister species of the one we work on, and we actually think that this fish is probably more widespread than what I've shown you on the map. It's just that folks haven't gone to the other mangroves to look for them. They're really difficult to find. They're very cryptic. Um, and you have to really get into the, like I said, the innards of the mangrove. So yes, I would say short answer, yes. I think based on the picture of Carrie being hip deep, um, I probably <laughs> would shy away from investigating the yeah. mangroves to find more. So Not you did mention, oh, oh sorry, you did mention Susie that you, you said they can live there for quite some time. And then you said, we'll get to that. So that's that's my burning question. I'm interested in in how long they can, can uh, survive there. So I'm assuming you're going to get to that. Yeah, well, I can tell you that now. So we know we know this from lab studies. So we work in them. We work with these fish in situ when we can. So we'll go to places like Belize to work with them in the wild. But to really understand kind of their their full biology and physiology, we need to work with them, work with them in the lab. So I have a colony of these fish here at Acadia with us that we study. And it was my colleague at the University of Guelph, Pat Wright, who did some work to try to figure out how long can they live out of water. And um, so far, it's over two months, but we think it's probably, depending on different conditions, they can probably stay out of water longer than that. So that's with no water. And the, uh, during this time, they would be um, getting oxygen because they can't survive without oxygen, but they would be taking oxygen up through their skin. Okay. That's pretty remarkable. So uh, just checking them. Okay, so the, no more questions on the side at this point in time. So carry on. Um, I, I have more, but I don't want to hog the air time. And, and uh, um, oh, he, we have one from John. He says, where and how do they reproduce? So that's a whole other talk, John. Um, <laughs> but also another really cool question and another reason why they are amazing. They are actually the only known vertebrate hermaphrodite. So, but it's even more complicated than that. So that means they can actually, they're not true clones of themselves because there is meiosis, but when you keep them in the lab for several generations, you effectively, they can clone themselves. So they pop out fertilized eggs. So the hermaphrodites have both um, eggs and sperm and they can self-fertilize and then release fertilized eggs. And then the offspring, after several generations in the lab, become genetically identical or are genetically identical to their parents. However, it's more complicated because in the wild, there are males, anywhere from two to 10% males. So you can get what we call outcrossing where hermaphrodites may lay unfertilized eggs that will get fertilized externally by the few males that are in the population. And to further complicate it, um, the hermaphrodites that have eggs and sperm internally and self-fertilize will sometimes lose their eggs, their ova, the, the ability to produce eggs and become secondary males in the lab. And there's so much we don't know about that, uh, this, um, what's happening here. And I actually have a couple of students currently um, setting up experiments to look at these secondary males and what what happens to make a secondary male. But great question. Mm 
So suffice it to say, there's a lot of moving parts. <laughs> a lot of moving parts. <laughs> and you did use you you did use a, you, a word there that I'd like to ask you about. And please believe me, I truly am like a fish out of water here with some of these questions. Good, and so I, that. I had to use it. Come on. <laughs> um, you used the term outcrossing. Could you just yeah that is yeah. So that's basically um, where you'd have, so if you think about a hermaphrodite that eventually will clone itself, so the genetics in the parent, that would, like genetics in the offspring. now joining. Um, outcrossing means when you have a male, now they're, you're adding different genetic material. So you're oh. mixing it up. So there's an outcross, you know, so there's more genetic material um, mixing in the population. Got it. Question. All right, I think we're good for questions on the side, so please carry on, Susie. Okay, great, thanks. Are we on the climate warming slide? No, we are now. Great, thanks. So climate warming has basically formed really a lot of what I've been interested in since I was at Acadia as an undergrad, which is a long time ago now. And a lot of my PhD work was on how fish deal with warming temperatures. So that's really been at the forefront of um, my research program and the work that we're doing here at Acadia um, with Acadia students. So tropical fish, you think, well, why aren't you working on Atlantic salmon or trout? And, and I actually do also work on local fish species. But the interest in for me um, to work on tropical fish is, well, they're wonderful and they're beautiful. You can sometimes go to warm places to do field work. But, but really, the real reason is that Tropical species, tropical fish in particular, are really at their edge. They are living at their limits in a warming world. So there's not a lot, we know from some experimental work, there's not a lot of buffer room um, as the water heats up. They live in fairly narrow thermal ranges because it's just kind of warm and warmer. And it's hugely. But they're, Is they're really exiting. at the thermal edge. Next slide, please, Una. So I mentioned earlier about this environmentally um, dependent uh, sociality. So when we think about social behavior, because I look at the interface between climate warming and social behavior, and many animals live in groups. So fish obviously form shoals or schools, um, but that's sometimes dependent on life stage. And as I've told you with the mangrove rivulus, it might be dependent on the environment. Um, group living has lots of advantages can give you better access to food, to mates, to habitat, protection from predators. Uh, sometimes though, living in groups, not unlike um, humans, they can lead to conflict or there's competition. So social behavior is really varied and interesting um, in all animals and it's varied and interesting in fishes as well. So the overarching question that we've been asking over the last couple of years is does the social environment affect how an animal responds to their physical environment specifically we're looking at fish and we have this really cool model with the mangrove rivulus that appears to have this environmentally dependent social behavior and we're looking to see how this animal in these differing social contexts copes with climate warming does the social, does your social environment affect how you deal with stress, basically? Next slide, please, Una. So I'm a very social person and <laughs> like to um, work in groups. And that's another reason why COVID-19 um, and isolation can be challenging personally, but professionally as well. And uh, here's a group of colleagues and collaborators that I've been working with over the last few years. And this is when we're doing field work in Belize, Pat Wright is in the green from the University of Guelph. Scott Taylor, who's taken a lot of those pictures you've seen, is from Florida. And Tamsin Blewett is a new faculty member at um, the University of Alberta. Next slide, please, Una. So this is a, I'm gonna show you a tiny bit of data, um, but hopefully to make the point, our hypothesis, our, our again, overarching hypothesis for a lot of this work is that social behavior interferes with adaptive thermal responses, pushing fish closer to the thermal limits. So this could be very negative, right? So if, this, if, the, if the presence of other fish or not, or isolation um, affects how you deal with stress, we have to really understand that if we're gonna make predictions about how fish will deal with climate warming. Next slide, please, Una. 
So you see here actually um, two cups and you'll have the rivulets are sitting and these are actually pee cups, you know, urine sample cups that we hold our fish in because when they're together, they can be quite aggressive. So you see the fish on the left is a little bit blurry is in water and you see the fish on the right is emerged. And what we find when we have them in the lab, we'll just have them in water, the conditions are fine and they will jump out and stick to the side of the cup and stay there indefinitely. And I'm just gonna show you a little video here. Or, Una, if you could press the video on the left-hand side on the cup. You can see that, are you seeing a video? Oh, just one second here. There we go. You should see the fish jumping up out of the cup and sticking onto the side of the cup. Yep. So that's what that's the behavior. So that's what it's doing in the cup, and that's really what it does um, in the wild too. And it will fling itself up onto those um, mangrove roots. <laughs> Next slide, please, Una. And this is another video. Um, you'll see the little play button, Una, on the bottom of this. Mm -hmm. This is a you can you can hit that. So this is a in the mangroves, and this is a pool of water that was high in hydrogen sulfide, high temperature, <laughs> low oxygen. And the fish will fling itself out, as you can see, and you know try to find another crab or a pool that might have better conditions. And it can kind of fling itself from pool to pool or move on to land where the conditions might be better. Um, so I show these videos to show that an adaptive behavior, something that is good for the fish when the water heats up, is to get out of there, find a new environment. It's like, this is hot, maybe if I jump out of the water, evaporative cooling might bring my body temperature down, or maybe I'll find a different environment that's cooler. So immersion or the temperature at which the fish jumps out is an important thing for us to measure. Next slide, please, Una. So you see a kind of duct tape <laughs> apparatus. Uh -huh. So we were in Belize and there's not a lot, and we're on a deserted island essentially, not a lot of equipment. So we have to really use our imagination, uh, which we did. So we were interested in whether or not, remember the hypothesis, does the social environment push fish to their limits and prevent adaptive responses? So we set up an experiment and we're used to the, those wires you see are actually heaters that are stuck in a fish aquarium. And we had wild fish and we stuck a mirror to the side of the tank, or we had an opaque, we had an opaque, a mirror actually covered over with duct tape. So an opaque control, if you will. Because we know, we knew this from before, fish really respond to their mirror reflection. They're aggressive fish. They, um, when they're put together, you know, they go after one another. So when they have a mirror reflection, they're very interested in their reflection and they see that as another fish. So they'll, they'll really keep going towards the mirror. So we have then a fish that has social stimulation with a mirror or not in these two conditions. Next slide, please, Una. So it's just brought up the mirrors on the side. Now. Okay, so that's, those are the two conditions. So with a okay. mirror and without a mirror, thanks. Next slide, please. So here's the only bit of data I'm gonna show you um, to finish up the talk. So again, we've done lots of experiments around this, and this is just the one example that I'll show you. So what you have on the y-axis, you see immersion threshold in degrees Celsius. So this is the temperature at which the fish jump out. So in that little kind of duct taped aquarium, we increased the temperature pretty quickly and monitored that. And then we monitored the temperature at which the fish jumped out. So obviously you want the fish to jump out at a lower temperature. So you can see on the bottom on the X axis, you see the opaque control, and then you see when the fish had a mirror. And you can see that in the mirror condition, the temperature is higher. Next slide, please, Una. So when fish had social stimulation with a mirror, they left water at a much warmer temperature. And actually, what I haven't shown you here, but we collected more data, the temperature at which they jumped out, so in and around 43, 44, is actually very close to their lethal temperature. 
So this was surprising to us how high it was. So they were so engaged with their mirror reflection, they waited till they almost cooked themselves before they left water. And they did, they all, and they all eventually jumped out, but waited till the kind of the highest temperature that it could be. So this is really fascinating to us. Next slide, please. Because it tells us that the social context or the sociability affects how fish are coping with environmental stress, in this case, warming. So some of the things that we're working on now in the lab is to try to understand, one, whether or not that engagement with their mirror reflection, is that, and the reason they jump out at a higher temperature, is that because the competition is more important? Or an alternate hypothesis, and one that we're actually testing right now, does that social stimulation maybe desensitize uh, thermal receptors so that the animal or the fish doesn't actually detect that the water's heating up? And if you even think about this with yourselves, I mean, I'm gonna make a human comparison here. If you were sitting in, I don't know, a sauna by yourself, you probably end up leaving at a cooler temperature than if you had a couple of friends in the sauna with you and you're chit-chatting around, you know, <laughs> chit-chatting and you, lose the ability to sense when it's really hot and you might leave the sauna at a warmer temperature. We're trying to understand whether or not fish can set the changes, how they sense temperature, or is it a competition? Um, next slide, please, Una. And this is just to um, remind me, and I don't need to remind anyone that um, we can't do this on our own. Uh, science is a very collaborative uh, activity and I've been so, grateful to work with such wonderful students and wonderful collaborators. And I'm looking forward to when our COVID isolation ends and we can get back to business, just like this fish school. And next slide, please, Una. And I wanted to thank uh, all the wonderful people that I work with. And you can see here some pictures of some Acadia folk. So this is Dawn Miner, um, who's actually in our Rivulus facility. She's holding a little cup with the Rivulus here at Acadia. Um, Brittany Scott, who's another research associate of mine, and two of my honor students who just recently graduated, Katie Horton and Taylor Wilson. Chloe Melanson is a new master's student in my lab, and um, Carmen Simonson uh, has just started her honors, too, in my lab at Acadia, and we've been funded, thankfully, to support some of our work to understand um, how fish respond to climate warming. And next slide, please. That's it. I would be happy to take any questions and thanks very much for joining us. So folks, do you have uh, questions for Susie that you'd like to either write in the chat function or feel, please feel free to, uh, to say them out loud. I'm sure she'd be happy to take your questions. Have you noticed a trend toward higher temperatures in the waters where you're doing your research? I think I got that a trend towards higher temperatures. Yeah, that's a great question. We've been monitoring now. Um, we've been going down there since the mid 2000s. Um, and yes, it's getting warmer. And the other interesting thing that we see um, is that there's a, there seems to be a little bit more variation too in temperatures. So we, we know what the kind of maximum is for these fish. We can push that a little bit. So as the temperature sort of inches up over the years, that maximum temperature that the fish can tolerate also gets pushed, but only to a limit. So that's what I mean when I talk about tropical fish, the temperatures are warming, but the limit kind of stays the same. So you kind of have this warming, 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 and then it's like, you can't really go past that ceiling. So that sort of, we call it a thermal safety margin for tropical fishes is very narrow. So, you know, I'm here working on mangrove fishes, but we need to be concerned about fishes in general and then tropical fishes, which are really being pushed to their edge. We have a question from John. Uh, what do fish eat? What do the fish eat? Mm -hmm. Great question, John. So when they're in water, we, we've t done some analysis to know that they eat um, tiny bugs that are in and around the mangroves. And there's a lot of them, I can tell you, <laughs> for nothing. <laughs> Um, so they, that's mostly what we find in their, in their stomachs. It's interesting when you think about them in air. So in the dry season, when they're in these logs, 
they're not feeding, right? They're stuck, they're in these logs stationary for a couple months, potentially. And we don't have a good idea about what's happening there. And we've been trying to think about some experiments we can do to figure that out. Um, it could be that they're absorbing some nutrients through their skin, which would be interesting in the leaf litter and in the logs. But we actually think that in addition to being an error for that period of time, they're, they're fasting, so they're not eating. Mm -hmm. Yet as soon as the, the water comes back, they're off to the races, having fun, reproducing, doing mm -hmm. all kinds of things, with lots of energy, even though they've been fasting for a long period of time. So they don't lose muscle mass, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Hibernating bears, it's a similar thing. They mm -hmm. do not lose the muscle mass. You that If you've ever broken your leg or twisted your ankle or sprained and been in a cast, after a couple of days, all of your muscle mass has gone. So it's interesting when you think about these fish, they don't lose that, that muscle tone and that muscle mass, even after a period of, a long period of no movement. Interesting. Next question is from Donalda and she says, how do the fish burrow in wood? Yeah, so great question, Donalda. And we don't know for sure, we, we, they don't always do that. So some of these logs have those natural burrows. So they're really, they can squid, squidge and squirm into them. So they'll, they're opportunistic. So they're gonna try to get um, a protected, moist, damp environment. So they're in the logs and they basically just kind of worm their way into any nook and cranny or crevice that they can find. And then what's interesting to us too is that that they log pack with all these other fish because again they're actually quite a solitary fish mm -hmm. except during these periods when they probably don't want to dry out so by kind of clumping together they avoid desiccation or drying out because they're their moist skins all you know stuck together they seem to find each other which i also find really interesting <laughs> we don't know I would suspect that a lot of the wood that, that they burrow into would be quite soft anyway, because it would be quite humid and quite wet. And so it might be a little yeah. easier than one might think in terms of burrowing into hardwood, right? That's exactly right. It's all, everything is very squidgy in the mangroves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, when, you were talking about, when you were talking about raising the temperature, you said that you did it quickly. Mm -hmm. Why would you, why does it, because I would, I, assumption, probably a bad assumption, that it wouldn't raise, wouldn't raise so quickly in its natural environment, or would it? Yeah, it's a good question. So there's two answers to that. So first, yes, it actually does raise quickly, and and for the fish anyway, because what you'll often find is I showed you those crab burrows. So they might, you know, we saw the fish flinging from one to another. In adjacent, we've measured this in the field. Adjacent crab burrows. Can have wildly different temperatures not only wildly different temperatures wildly different oxygen levels salinity levels so they're really going from one condition to a completely different condition acutely so very quickly so even though the you know the temperature in their crab burrow may not rise quickly because they move from an to different environments they can see those sudden increases in temperature but the reason we do the quick increase in that experiment I showed you, it's actually um, a test called a critical thermal maximum test. And the way you do that is that you raise the temperature quickly and then you look to see at what point the, the fish responds like I showed you. So it's, it's almost like an established protocol that gives you that, we call it a CT max number or it's their critical thermal maximum temperature. And basically it's a proxy for how tolerant the animal is to temperature change. So it's a standard kind of rapid heat ramp, we call it. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. But they actually would could see that dramatic change in nature. Right. So Susie, you mentioned that you have a colony of these fish at Acadia and John's asking, can you recreate, recreate the mangrove-like environment at Acadia? Mm, if only. <laughs> well, we can to a certain extent, John. Um, so we have um, the temperature and we have a small room. So we have them at the appropriate temperature. So the kind of average sort of cycle of temperature in the mangrove is 25 to 30 degrees Celsius. We keep it humid, easier to do in the summer than in the winter. And that's going to be actually part of, of some of the things we're looking at in our experiments. 
Um, so we have recreated a little mangrove microcosm. We've done things, um, we don't currently have that right now in the lab, but where we've taken fish aquaria, kind of packed it full of mud and created a little simulated crab burrows to try to look at fish behavior and how it responds to different changes in the environment. So you can kind of create um, burrows. But yes, we have the fish in there doing well. And we have at Acadia, we have, we call them isogenic lineages. And what that means is that we've got three lines that are in each line, they're genetically identical. So really when we do our experiments, it's like we're working on twins or triplets or quadruplets because they're genetically, we know within a lineage, they're genetically the same. And then between lineages, they're genetically different. So for the types of the type of research that we do, that's a really powerful tool because I can take a line of fish that are all genetically the same, and then we give them an environment like a high rising temperature. And if they all do something different, which they do, it means that that response to temperature is not genetic. So it allows us to take genetics out of the equation, right? And then that is interesting. And what we're finding is a lot of these responses to the to a changing environment with climate warming is not about genetics. So it's a powerful tool to allow us to separate the complication because Una and I might respond to the sauna very differently. And we could say, well, you know, it's my genes, right? I, you know, I grew up in Newfoundland. I'm always in the sauna. <laughs> So we can, any differences in our behavior or even our physiology could be down to our genetics. We don't know, or it could be something else. But by working on an animal like this, I can clearly say, my students can clearly say, no, this is not about genetics. It's about, we call it phenotypic plasticity, which is, it's, it's another really, another great reason um, why these fish are so cool. Okay. <laughs> That's exactly what John wrote. Cool. And I was about to say the same thing. So I think we're all on the same page on that one. So Susie, do you have a do you have a sense of how many other fishes are in the hostile environment environment in the mangrove? Yeah, we do. Um, and not many, at least where we've been working. And again, I think it's because it's so hostile. So I mentioned the high hydrogen sulfide, the rotten egg smell. So that's lethal. High hydrogen sulfide is lethal to most animals and it's a, it's a toxin. So we've just actually, Carrie, my student has just done her master's thesis where she was looking at hydrogen sulfide and how these fish cope with high hydrogen sulfide. So there's not very many animals, let alone fish that can cope with that. We studied when we were there a couple of years ago, another three species. So mosquito fish is another species that some of some listeners might know about and find some mosquito fish. Mollies is another um, example. Not many. There's not many. Now, I talked at the beginning of my talk about how mangroves are such great nurseries for lots of species. Mm -hmm. You'll find that kind of on the outside in that kind of glamorous mangrove picture that I showed you. And certainly if, if, you've, if you've snorkeled in around mangroves, you see, you know, you can see puffer fish and lots of tropical fish. But what I'm talking about is like in the middle of the mangrove in the mud, not a lot of fish. A few, but again, because they, they have to be tolerant of no oxygen, high temperature, high hydrogen sulfide, um, salinity fluctuations, that's another really wild thing. It can be fresh water or high, high salt, hyper saline. Yeah, they're, they're fine in both. So another question from John, it says, he says, it looks like they have multiple stressors. How does that affect their responses? So they seem to be able to tolerate multiple stressors simultaneously from what we've observed in the field. We are, you know, it's, it's always difficult to determine, you know, especially in, when you start setting up lab experiments, how to, you're, you're trying to control one variable, as John, I know you know, you know, then you're trying to change lots of things at once. We have been doing that. So for example, in our hydrogen sulfide experiments, when we expose fish to hydrogen sulfide that they would experience in nature, we know that that's also a really low oxygen environment and it's always a high temperature environment. So they appear to be quite tolerant of 
all of these stressors that are, they're experiencing simultaneously. And they appear to have both physiological and biochemical, cellular and behavioral responses and adaptations that allow them to thrive. You know, and their reproductive strategy, which is so bizarre, likely has something to do with this too. Uh, sorry, did I hear another question coming? Uh, I'm just I'm wondering with regard to the water temperature, if I'm understanding you correctly, uh, the fish are able to uh, increase their tolerance as the water temperatures increase. But in your years of research, what would you say is the increase in temperature in those tropical waters? By how many degrees has it warmed over the years? Yeah, I don't know if I can say that with with confidence um, because we there have not been, unfortunately, um, the monitoring, the, you know, the consistent monitoring that you uh, that you might find. Like, for example, I can tell you in the Miramichi, right, in New Brunswick, where there's lots where the fisheries and oceans does a lot of monitoring. And again, it also depends on there's pockets. So so we worked in different areas of that same mangrove and you'll go in some seas, it's seasonal. So sometimes it'll be dried up in one area that where you worked two years ago, there was lots of water. So it's hard to say what that degree Celsius um, temperature will be, but but maybe it's easier to answer the, answer the kind of the first part of your question where I said that the tolerance can increase, but it, it's to a point. And what we know is that yes, you can you can move that that CT max right or that critical thermal maximum a little bit, but not much. That's not very flexible. That's not very plastic. And we know for these fish that that critical thermal maximum is in and around 43 degrees Celsius, 44 degrees Celsius, which seems like that's super high. We have measured the temperature in one of those small little crab burrows at 42, 43 degrees Celsius. So what I can tell you is that the temperature is getting warmer there. And we're also the other way you can tell that is that bodies of water, you know, that you could rely upon within the mangrove as being full of water when you go back in the wet season, even don't have water in them. So that's another concern, right, that those micro habitats that a lot of animals exploit are drying up. But I don't have, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't confidently say what that, you know, it's gone up. I don't have those models and you would need that kind of constant monitoring to be able to say that with confidence. But we know what the critical thermal maximum is. We know what we're measuring in the field and that has us worried. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Any other questions? I have one for you, Susie. You mentioned that the mud skipper was one of your favorites. Did I did I get the name proper? Did, yes. I, did I get that right? And is yes. it because it looks like a muppet, or is there another? <laughs> it's partly it. They're amazing animals, and I've only seen one once. I I was on a trip during one of my sabbaticals to go to see Komodo dragons um, in Indonesia, which were also amazing. And on the way to see these Komodo dragons, which you can only see with them um, guided, with a guide, um, an expert, there were these mud skippers all over the mud surface. So they're just really interesting in that they, they spend a lot of their time out of water. They look like Muppets, as you said, Una. They um, have this really interesting, if you've ever watched any David Attenborough, there's some really good, he's got some really great clips of mud skippers gaping and that they're aggressive to one another and they, they um, pose and there's dominance, there's subordinates. They have their um, egg burrows underground, but in air. So I've seen videos where the, the parent will take a gulp of air in the air, swim down in the water, come up into a kind of a chamber and in air with the eggs all along the inside of the chamber and blow on the eggs and then descend <laughs> from that chamber back into the water, take another gulp of air back down, blow on the eggs all day long. So the eggs continue to get oxygen. Wow. 
That's, hey, that's nature, my, great. That's my high maintenance children. <laughs> high <laughs> maintenance. <laughs> we have uh, Nancy Hendrigan would like to ask you a question, Susie. Hi, yeah. Hi, Susie. I'm not putting the video on. I actually am going to pass over to Peter O, who's sitting here, and he has a question. Oh, hi, Peter O. Hi, Susie. How are you? Good. How are you? I, I love this kind of stuff. I think it's extremely fascinating, but I'm, I'm also a big picture kind of person. And I wonder, and, and I understand the sort of detailed uh, examination of temperatures and, and jumping and all this other stuff, but is there a bigger picture application that you do with a study like this. Uh, I mean, I, I recall when Nancy and I went to Slovenia and we went into a cave and they showed us these uh, lily white salamanders that had no eyes. Yeah. And it, it, it's because they live in darkness, so they don't need eyes. Mm -hmm. right? um, and, and so uh, animals adapt to their environment. And I just wondered uh, whether there's, you know, what's the next step beyond when you have finished your research? Um, great question. So you never really finish your research. <laughs> That's the first I thing. That. You I always know need that, some more questions. Yeah. But the big picture um, of this really is how do animals, and I mostly work on fish, are they going to, can they cope? And mm -hmm. how are they coping with climate warming? Some will adapt, some won't. And do they move? Do they have that capacity? What are the limits? So, so it's first important to determine the limits and what things affect the thermal limits. And so this is why I think working on these tropical species is important and you know why I've been drawn to it because as I was saying earlier, tropical fish are already very close to their limits. We know what their thermal maximum are. And so, you know, and as the temperature creeps up. So the things that I've been interested in is what else affects that coping mechanism. And so we've been looking at this social context because you can't often control whether or not you're going to, are you going to run into a competitor? Are you going to run into another school of fish? Are these other biotic variables going to impact how animals cope with warming and climate change? What are the, you know, what are those capacities? What are the limits? What is their adaptive potential, we sometimes call it? Can they acclimate or not? Um, and yeah, understanding the other stressors, I think as John pointed out, the other stressors or just even the other conditions that could affect that. That allows us, you know, we need to understand that before there's any kind of mitigation that happens. Like mangroves is one example, and you're quite right. This is a kind of detailed study that's an example that you can extrapolate. And I think that the thing that I, uh, my Acadia students are working on now that's got me really kind of charged up is that we want to know whether or not the social environment influences how animals sense temperature. Now, I'm using fish as an example, but like I said earlier in the talk, you know, the basic physiology of a fish, a frog, you know, a salamander, it, a human, it's the same. We use the same hormonal systems the same thermal receptors, they're exactly the same. So right. we get a well, lot of insight into even sensation and how sociality or social behavior influences how animals sense and detect changes. Right. In so the, the, the big picture could possibly even uh, relate to us. It could. I mean, I'm always cautious to make that leap, but certainly that the basic fundamental biology is the same. And right, so it's, right. it, and it's, it's easy, I think, for us to kind of get that big picture. But yeah, because it's like, again, it's the same proteins, it's the same ion channels. I always find that really interesting. They're exactly the same. They're high, and we call that a highly conserved response. Mm -hmm. So it's often, and, and I would also argue, this is one last thing I'll say to Peter O, and I was going to add this to the talk, I would argue that when, if we want to understand the effects of climate change on organisms, it's far better to look at an animal that can't control its body temperature. You and I, we're thermoregulators, right? When it's minus 20, we don't go outside and all of a sudden our, our temperature drops to minus 20. We can regulate. 
whereas most fishes, almost all fishes, cannot. So they are, they succumb or they are, their body temperature does whatever the environment does. So it's much better to look at animals that are conformers, thermal conformers we call them, to understand how climate warming is going to affect species. We regulate, so we're not that interesting when it comes to climate change, right? Or put on a coat. Um, right. So you've taken the one of the big variables out and then you can control it. Yeah. Wonderful. So so Correct. Peter's question was a nice segue into, we have a, one last question for you, uh, Susie from Victoria. And she says, and, and it was, you covered it um, just in answering Peter's, as I say, she says, out of curiosity, how would you test in the lab if their social, social, sociality ooh, is changing how the fish sense temperature? So how, 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 is, how is that being tested? Well, I love that question. And it's so funny. I was just online with my student earlier today as we were talking about her experimental design to how we do this. And we, we were really wrestling with this. So I think we're gonna do, um, and this has been done in, we know there's been experiments done in mammals like us and in other, not very many fish actually, but in some lizards. You can stimulate thermal receptors in your skin without changing temperature. So, so when you burn yourself on the burner, Ow. what you're doing is you're activating these thermal receptors in your skin and it's basically an ion channel that it's a spinal reflex but eventually gets synthesized in your brain and you move your hand away but you know it hurts and it's a calcium channel so calcium comes in and causes pain hot chili peppers this is kind of a long answer but hot chili peppers and the main ingredient in hot chili peppers is capsaicin that is also that same ion channel, it will stimulate those ion channels. And if you've ever chopped chilies, hot chilies, and like tried to put your contacts in or rubbed your eyes without washing your hands, you know that that is excruciatingly painful. And sometimes you can even feel it on your hands. Although the threshold for pain is different in your eyeballs and in your hands, but that's a, a different talk too, but it's interesting. So we're, we plan to use the main ingredient in hot chilies to activate those thermal receptors in the absence of heat, right? So you can add that capsaicin and see when the fish jumps out and see if that's different when they're with another fish or when they're by themselves or whether they're with a group of fish. That's the plan. So we need to be able to stimulate those sensing because we can't do this with temperature because it's like, is it a sensation? We know that these ion channels sense temperature. So can we stimulate those ion channels? And will the fish respond appropriately? And does that change when they're with another fish? I'll have to give you, I'll have to do the follow-up. <laughs> we'll, we'll have part B later on yeah. in the year for sure. Uh, listen, yeah. so, uh, so lots of great thumbs up and, and thanks on the side, uh, Susie, in the chat function for all of the um, incredibly interesting information. Lots of questions um, and, and very much appreciate the time that you've given out of your evening for our alumni community and for our second of our virtual events. Um, so we're going to carry on, folks who have joined us. We have a, a schedule that will take us well into the summer. Um, and, and as I say, Susie, really appreciate your time and, and, you know, you've given us a lot to think about and particularly as you started off by saying in this time of isolation, I mean, it sounds like we could really learn uh, a couple of pretty key survival uh, methods from these fish by uh, learning a little bit about their adaptation and learning about their ability to deal with multiple stressors. I, I think that those true. are completely applicable for us right now. So uh, thanks, everybody, for coming, and uh, we Thank hope to you. see you again soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Una. You're welcome. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care, everyone.